Next speaker is Ayush, and he is a senior machine learning engineer with Pinterest. He's also a startup mentor and a seed investor, so I'm going to have to talk to you about that. <laughs> Very fancy. It's no wonder that his term that he chose is innovation. Welcome, Ayush. Yeah, welcome everyone and thanks for joining. I'm, a, I'm Ayush, a senior machine learning engineer at Pinterest. Today in this talk, we would be going over the journey of evolution of ads ranking model at Pinterest. Before that, like just to recap, like Pinterest is a visual discovery engine. Our mission is to bring everyone the inspiration to create a life that they love. To do this, Pinterest has different touch points that a user can interact with. This is the first feed that a user sees when they visit the platform. This is the home feed. Home feed utilizes machine learning models to curate content based on the past engagements and interests that a user might have. Here, since I've been wanting to travel to Atlanta for this conference, I've been searching for travel ideas, which you can see. Also, my interests around cooking and painting are some of those things that I see on my feed. If I want to search for something, I can go about and use the search tab, either through a text page or an image-based solution. Also, if I'm interested in a particular pin, I can click on it to get more information. And that's when I land up on the related pin surface. Now let's see how ads fit in into this ecosystem. Ads are the content that are highlighted by this promoted by symbol. Ads help us to connect users with advertisers and in, a, in an attempt to fulfill their inspiration to action journey. Ads like these can help users to buy the products that they are seeing on the website. Now, Pinterest has billions of content. To bring this experience, we need to swift through these billions of content at low latency, something around 200 milliseconds to 300 milliseconds. We need to ensure that our predictions are performant so that we can learn user characteristics, do these predictions in real time, and also ensure that we are able to serve it at high QPS. Pinterest has more than 450 million monthly active users. Not only this, we need to make sure that we are able to capture the user feedback in a timely manner and make sure that recommendations are responsive. To attain all of these objectives, the system needs to embrace a multi-objective optimization problem. Now going into detail about what ads are in general. Ads are a way to connect advertisers with users. At Pinterest, Pinterest provides a performance ads business to connect users with the relevant content. An advertiser can have different marketing goals, be it awareness to create just brand awareness, or something like driving more clicks to the platform. Now to bring these products to market and ensure that we can connect with the relevant content, we need to make sure that we are able to, uh, we are able to understand what would be the right probability of conversion or a click during these instances. Not only optimizing for advertisers is enough, we also need to make sure that we value user satisfaction on the platform, which comes through many auxiliary signals like good clicks, hides, saves, and repins. Advertisers also care about driving more, content, more users to their platform so that they can fulfill the entire journey. It could be something like checkout and add to cards. These events are some activities that don't happen on Pinterest, but happen, but happen much more downstream. To ensure all of these are able to be done in a performant way, we have sophisticated machine learning models. Now imagine that we have this system. Now we want to explore adding more creatives instead of just having simple images. We want to go about adding videos and collections to the platform. Not only we would need new predictions like video views, but we would also need to make sure that we have all other predictions that we had so that we can quantify user satisfaction. More, more or less, like we have more complexities in terms of the surfaces that we have, like home feed, search, and related pins. When a user visits home feed, we don't have any context of what they are looking for. When someone does a search query, you have a search, search context that you can utilize. And when, when someone is looking at our related pins, they can look at more relevant content. So all of these are heterogeneous in some nature. As the product grows, you need to make sure that you're able to handle this complexity in a way that's scalable linearly, not exponentially. And before going into further details about the evolution, let's also see a high-level overview of what the ads delivery funnel looks like. Given that we have millions of content that you can show to a user at a particular time, understanding the context that the user is, in general, is needed to make performance predictions. In every typical recommendation system, it's a tiered system. There are candidate generators, which swift through these millions of pins to create a small set of candidates that you want to have precise predictions on. This could be something as just looking at fresh content, looking at users' recent interactions, or embedding-based generators. 
Once we have narrowed down the scope from millions of candidates to like thousands of candidates, these are then passed to a ranking model, which generates precise predictions for all of the predictions that we discussed before. Once we have a prediction value, then there's a logic to combine these prediction values to understand which advertisement or which insertion of the candidate is the most beneficial for Pinterest, our users, and the advertisers. And then coupled with different, different business logics like diversity, spacing, and pacing, these are finally rendered on the screen to give the best experience. The focus of this talk is this ranking model, which is catering to deliver precise predictions. In 2014, when the first machine learning models were being developed, the first model was a linear, like a linear model utilizing through logistic regression. To improve the expressive power of this model, we moved to a gradient boosted decision tree plus logistic regression based model. This architecture comes from a seminal Facebook paper. So now if you can want to represent a context, there are four ways that you can refer, in four pillars that you can represent it. It could be something like a user feature that is character characterizing your users. It could be a pin features that are characterizing your content. It could be an interaction feature between your user and the pin. Or it could be a feature that characterizes the time of the day or day of the week. So for these features, the GBDT models are used to learn the nonlinear transformations. Once we have learned these nonlinear transformations, you can generalize to different contexts. Then we have logistic regression models. One thing to note here is that GBT models cannot handle high cardinality features. So to having high cardinality features, we have a combination of a logistic regression model. In the logistic regression model, it also utilizes ID-specific features. From what that I mean, it's trying to capture an advertiser ID, an ad group ID, or a pin ID. For ads in particular, different advertisers can have different characteristics. So to learn something specific to the advertiser, we use the ID features. In this particular scenario, ads inventory keeps on changing, like ads features, like new ad groups keep on creating, old ad groups keep on dying. So we need to make sure that our models are able to train incrementally. In this setup, GBTs, due to their inherent nature, cannot be trained incrementally. They are trained in a batch and are static, but our logistic regression keeps on training in an incremental fashion. One thing to note at this point, like this is in like around 2017, when open source solutions were not that common. Around this time, our GBTs are trained in an XGBoost library. They're embedded through an internal system into TensorFlow. But when we are serving, to ensure that we have low latency systems, we utilize an in-house serving system called as Lynchpin. Over time, we see that this kind of a hybrid kind of system slows down dev velocity. The other thing, as the product kept on increasing, we had so many models that we need to maintain, more than 60 models at a time in production. Now if you want to add a new model or a new product, it becomes much harder to bring that to market. We had super long cycles for feature adoption because the feature that's good in a one model, we try to add it to different models and takes a long super quarter-like kind of effort. Similarly, deprecation is harder. The other complexity that we are facing is that these GBT models cannot be trained that frequently and that is not capturing our feature distribution as it changes over time leading to suboptimal systems, not only in terms of the engineering, like dev velocity hit, but also in terms of performance to business. So this was between 2014 to 2017 as the product was still scaling up. The next advancement that we had was investing in replacing this nonlinear transformation coming in from the GBDTs, but utilizing neural network based approaches. These are simple neural network based approaches and this approach is inspired from Google's seminal work in this field. So instead of the GBT nonlinear translations, now you utilize your machine learning, like MLP-based layers, to learn these nonlinearities. One thing to note that till this point, like these machine learning architectures were relying on heavy handcrafting of feature engineering. So if you want to learn two features together, you define that in your feature logic. So this kind of handcrafting of features became harder as you as the feature space kept on scaling higher. So as the features increased, creating new features became harder. So in the next step between, yeah, one thing I forgot to mention, like these red boxes are the relative improvements that we see in each of these improvements. So this is telling about like how much improvements each of these techniques gave us. So between 2018 to 2020, Pinterest spent a good amount of time to re-architecturing its architecture so as it can serve the business needs for the future. This is the first like deep multitask model that Pinterest has. We call it as AutoML, which is kind of different than what the industry has. This is an internal name for Pinterest deep learning model. The main differences in this kind of architecture is this model can take raw features as input. We don't need to create features handcrafted by hand based on prior intuitions and beliefs. 
This way we can focus more on just creating the features and less on designing the interactions and crossing between the features. The model itself has the logic to learn different feature interactions through summarization and latent cross layers, which I'll go into some detail. The model can learn this feature interaction much better than what we were doing by handcrafting. Thirdly, we introduced the concept of co-learning tasks through multitasking. By doing this, we could combine the number of models we are training significantly from over 60 to like six models. We can combine all these predictions which are kind of similar like click, long, long click, repaint, or hide. This is like the Pinterest AutoML architecture. This has different components, like I'll go into some of those details. Like the first is the representation layer. This is like an interface between, between your raw features and your model architecture. So for neural networks in particular, feature transformations are important and feature pre-processing is needed to ensure that features are having a similar value range. For numerical features, they could be as simple as squashing, clipping, or doing log normalizations. For categorical features, they could be like projecting into a hash, hash embedding space or learning embeddings or vocabulary based on what you see in the data. Then we had a concept of summarization layer. So this summarization layer brings in ideas from the previous world where we were handcrafting features, where we wanted to, let's say, two features to be learned together. So this is an optional layer. You can probably specify what features you want to learn together, and that enables to learn a common embedding for them. Over time, we tried to reduce this kind of handcraftness so that we can focus just on raw features in general. The third layer is the most important layer. This is the crossing layer. In this layer, feature interactions are learned of the higher orders. This is a multiplicative layer. And there's published research around this, like from Google, like DCNV2. If you have latency concerns, they are like low rank versions of the same, and mass nets. And finally, we have like a fully connected classic deep neural network layers on top of it. Around this time, like if you look at like this basic, this basic backbone is creating features from raw features in general. Once you have done, like most of the predictors that we shared before, like click, good clicks, repin, the only difference being is that they are different in their optimization or objectives. The amount of features that are flowing into these are kind of very similar. So in this iteration, we can utilize this feature crossing that we have learned, not only for one objective, but across multiple objectives. In this particular scenario, we also realized that there might be some heterogeneous tasks, like for Pinterest, standard ads and shopping ads are two heterogeneous kind of pin types. We also split the network into two parts so that we can control how much we want to share and how much we want to learn differently. This allowed Pinterest to combine the models significantly down from 60 to 6 that we need to maintain. By doing this, not only we saved our maintenance cost, but we also saved the serving complexity because the same model can infer many, many multiple predictions. So this is the time between 2018 to 20. So over two years went in to bring this kind of a model because it was fundamentally changing the way we were doing machine learning. So it, it took us time, but eventually it built us a platform that we could iterate faster. So the gains that come after that were pretty, pretty fast and scalable. Till this point, whatever we are doing is focusing on building architectures, adding new layers, and defining better ways to combine features. The next set of improvements came from better feature engineering, which we were not able to do in the prior world. The first among them is the attention sequence. So if you look at a user, how a user visits the platform, they have a journey. They interact with multiple different pins. So what we want to do is to utilize this journey in a way to define what the user's next action could be, to define from this inspiration that they're getting on the platform towards their next action. I think this slide got messed up, but yeah. So I think before we go there, like PinSage is one of the most important features for Pinterest. Like PinSage is a graph-based embedding solution. For every pin in the system, we define embeddings based on the visual description of the pin, the textual description, and how people interact with the pin. Utilizing these embeddings, we are able to generate rich, rich dense representations for every pin. As we go forward, let's assume this is the sequence and this is the pin that we want to rank. We can use attention model to influence which part of the journey we need to pay more focus on. Let's say in this, in this kind of a journey, the first two pins are more relevant for the target pin that we have, which is related to a cooking. So in this particular scenario, when we are trying to featureize this sequence in a way, we will try to pay more attention to the pins that are more relevant to the pin that you're scoring. And now if you have another pin that's trying to cater for travel, it could be some other combination. By bringing this attention-based model, we could see that we are able to capture this sequence in the graph space or the pin space that we have 
to keep the model to be low latency because we have very tight latency budgets, we are restricted to use only short term sequence at this point because if we expand our sequences, our cost will increase. We utilize the pre-trained embeddings that were coming from a different system as a process to converse this model faster. On top of it, to learn non-linearities, we introduce simple MLP transforms. Now, by introducing these MLP transforms, we not only get the non-linearities, but we also are able to control our output dimension, which can control the number of parameters that we have. Till this point, Pinterest is still using CPU to serve models. So this is like the journey, we started doing the journey modeling. Around this time, we also realized that the power, the journey that the user has brings to the platform. But till this point, Pinterest was training in TensorFlow, but using an in-house built solution for training in C++. This limited our ability to go to more complex architectures. So at this point, Pinterest also moved to native serving, so that whatever we train on is whatever we serve with. After that, we went to like a transformer-based sequence. Like transformers could be a better encoder instead of just using simple attention modules. In this particular scenario, whatever the sequence we have, we collected more than 100 user events across past three months. So this is the sequence that we have. Now this sequence can bring a lot of like latency issues. To, to counter for that, the sequence only had few simple features, such as what's the action type, did they click or not, what is the category type of the pin, we also introduced the notion of time so that we can differentiate between something that happened like a day ago versus that happened 14 days ago. So this time awareness brought in even further gains. Between this time, we, we realized the importance of like a sequence of the journey that the user has and it can fuel many more powerful model architectures. As we go forward, we wanted to use our pin-based embeddings that we have, which are even a rich denser signal, but because of serving architectural limitations, we couldn't go in that direction. The next step, I think this slide also got messed up, but I think you can look at the image. But in the next step, we wanted to combine these long-term sequences with short-term sequences. So the way we can do that is we can expand these sequences, let's say for a user who has maybe like six months worth of activity, we can use all of these sequences. For part of the sequence, we can restrict it to a narrow range. Pinterest has a published paper called Pinnerformer to go into more details. So we can restrict it to smaller, like we can restrict it to like maybe let's say last few few months. Like let's say we remove the last few 15 activities, but everything beyond that is learned through an offline model. This model is trained offline, so it doesn't have any latency requirements. Going forward, we can use this as a feature into a downstream task. Now, the real-time sequence can also utilize pin sage embeddings that we have, which are richer denser signals as part of the model learning, and this can improve the performance. As we move across all these dimensions in general, like we, we started, we invested in simple models, we moved to more complex models, more to GPU serving recently with these architectures around long sequences. And we also recently migrated our training machine learning stack to MLM and PyTorch, and we can have a blog to discuss. But one thing to share here is that Today, I only shared about the architectural involution, how the architecture went from single, simple to complex models, but empowering WebScale ML is much complicated. It has a lot of steps. To bring, this to bring these innovations in production, we had to ensure that Pinterest also has a good, good building blocks to build these models. And there are a lot of innovations that happen across all the stack to bring these models in. Also, I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge all the teams working hard to bring the best experience to Pinners. Yep, thank you.